I'm Chris Bussing and welcome to my channel. I was thinking about the mission for the new year in 2023 and I landed on helping people access personal transformation through tech sales. It's an incredible career path that opens up opportunities for financial freedom, connection with great people, and ultimately growing more as a person and expanding your horizon. So excited to share that opportunity with you. And who better to share this opportunity of tech sales with you than Kyle Coleman? I've got an incredible guest. This guy went from SDR to SVP at Clary in under 10 years. He really illuminates what's possible and he's hired over 200 SDRs and interviewed thousands. Today we're going to talk, I mean, pretty big deal, right? Um, <laughs> and today we're going to talk about exactly what it takes to get a job as an SDR and how to maximize your time as an SDR and even the long-term career path in tech sales. So make sure to hit the like button because the YouTube algorithm loves that and will show the video to more people who could benefit from the message. And make sure to subscribe to the channel for weekly videos committed to your success in tech sales. So without further ado, guys, Kyle Coleman. Kyle, thanks for joining. And I'd love to just dive right into it. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your story and your mission? Uh, absolutely, Chris. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Excited excited to share this journey with you. And, and you and I, when we connected before this, we are cut from the same cloth. We're motivated by the same thing, which is to elevate the sales profession. I think too often sales gets a bad rap and, and people sort of begrudgingly take on a sales career thinking that they're doing something smarmy or something that is, you know, uh, not not a, a great station to be in in life. And it couldn't be further from the truth. So I, that's my mission. That's what drives me. I want people to understand that the skills that you build in a sales role, in an SDR role, are enduring skills that last a lifetime. And whether you want to pursue sales for the rest of your career or whether you want to go into something related but different like I've done, the foundational skill set is there for you. Um, so I became an SDR at my first tech company back in 2013. I was the sixth employee, first SDR. I grew the SDR team from just myself to about 65 or 70 people globally over the course of six years. The company uh, grew from 100K in revenue to 100 million in revenue in wow. that time frame, and was acquired by Google in the summer of 2019 for two and a half billion dollars. So that one went pretty well. I jumped over to Clary in 2019 to lead both SDR as well as enablement. And then over the years, took on demand generation, took on customer marketing, took on value engineering, product marketing. And now I lead the entire marketing and enablement team here at Clary. What's so funny is I was working at Google Cloud and I remember the Looker acquisition and we were so excited about it. And it was a workload, as we called it, that I really focused on selling. What, what a great product and, and what successes you've had. Um, that's so cool. And now at Clary, uh, so much exciting things are in front of you. And we'll talk more about that later on. But what are some of the qualities that are, or, uh, excuse me, the skill sets that being an SDR and being tech sales teaches you that lend themselves most useful to things like entrepreneurship and living your best life? What are some of those key skill sets? Oh, man, uh, where to start? The, the, the way you work and the way that you can be successful, the beautiful thing about sales is that it's a race against yourself. Like it's how much do you want to put into it? And that's why so many former athletes um, do so well in a sales role is because they have that intrinsic motivation to constantly want to challenge themselves and find ways to improve. And that mindset, knowing that there's always something you can do better. That's key to any sort of career that you want to pursue. There's, there's an interesting sort of distinction that a lot of top uh, CEOs and venture capitalists will think about where they, the distinction is between the person who is a know-it-all and thinks that they've got it all on lockdown and somebody who is a learn-it-all and is in a constant state of learning. And the latter group of people are the most successful group of people. You know, Every billionaire on the planet is a learn-it-all. And that's what sales forces you to, to become. It forces you to be somebody who's constantly inspecting their own process, looking at what's working, being really critical uh, and, and holding yourself accountable to what's not working and to improve. And so that mindset is enduring. That mindset sticks. And there's a bunch of other things that we could talk about from time management and organization and communication skills and the rest of it. But really, it's, it's the mindset and it's the individual accountability that for me and for so many other folks who I see graduating out of SDR and sales ranks, that's what sticks with them. And that's what makes them successful in the long term. 
Yeah, you're reminding me of the concept of a growth mindset where failures and setbacks aren't immovable objects, but opportunities to springboard to the next level. So just being curious, I, it's so important. I remember when I was at Oracle as an SDR, I just came out of a security training because they have the databases and infrastructure, but there's security components. And I thought, man, I'm so smart now. And I cold called a CISO and started just talking his ear off about what we could do. And he hung up on me, <laughs> it reminded me. The, the moment you think you know it all, you cut off your potential. It's not about us. It's about the customer. But we could open up a can of worms there, but I wanted to take you down a different can of worms, which is uh, tell me about the process of hiring, you know, hundreds of SDRs and the bumps and bruises along the way in hiring for, I think it was Looker, right? Where you really right. get a team. And then from there, we could dive into illuminating really the qualities that hiring managers are looking for. But first off, what was your journey? What were the bumps and bruises? Yeah, for sure. So I, I'm really glad you you just mentioned the word curiosity, Chris. We'll get back to that in a second. But um, Looker was a bit unique, founded in 2012. And um, the founders at the time were had spent their whole life com doing this awful commute over in California from the beach over the mountains and into the valley over this really treacherous highway pass. It's called Highway 17. And the founder of the company, his name is Lloyd. Lloyd said, I've been doing this hellish commute my whole life. We're not doing this anymore. This company, Looker, is going to be headquartered and we're going to run it out of Santa Cruz, California. Santa Cruz, California is 30 miles away from the Silicon Valley, but is a totally different world. It's a beach town. It's full of locals. It's not necessarily inundated with technology. The mountains that separate the valley from the beach do a pretty good job separating the, the cultures or had, I should say. And this was a bold sort of move for our founder to make. And it also created a handful of challenges for me as a person who was trying to build a team and, and hire. So at the time, the, the guidance that I got and the feedback that I got from mentors and other people who are building similar teams was, here's the talent profile. Look for people who came from this school, typically Ivy League, who studied this major, typically some sort of business major, and, or who are connected to this, this, or this person, typically friends and family and parents and stuff like that. And that talent pool just was not available for me in Santa Cruz. I didn't have the Stanford alumni. I didn't have the the people that were really steeped in you know silicon valley uh, culture and things like that so i had to think very differently and thinking differently for me meant okay that profile of that that you just told me about of somebody who's successful in sales it's not about like lines on a resume it's way more about how they think and how they operate it's the capabilities it's the mindset that we're trying to uh, multiply here that we're trying to find fits for and hire for and what are those mindset traits. What are those things that make a successful salesperson? Number one on the list is curiosity. Somebody who is always self-starting and eager to learn something new. Passion in life. They need to have some sort of spark. Show me that you can get excited about something, talk excitedly about something, convince somebody that that thing that's important to you should be important to them. That's what passion is for me. And then we get into organization and creativity and communication skills and a handful of other things. But really for me, it's curiosity and passion. And if I'm able to build a profile of folks that have that shared way of thinking, I don't necessarily care about what you studied in school or where you went to school or if you went to school. I don't care. What I care about is that you think and operate in a way that is productive, that you're going to bring something to the table that the rest of the team maybe doesn't have so that this team is actually a, a team in a sense that somebody's weaknesses are made up for by somebody else's strengths. And we operate that same way. Like if you're fielding or, or putting on a court a basketball team, you don't want five centers running around. You need a point guard. You need a, sh a shooting guard. You need the center. You need that diversity of role to round out a highly functioning team. And that's what I was able to after a handful of bumps and bruises along the way of trying and failing to fit the traditional profile ultimately created my own profile and it worked very well. And it became my hiring ethos to this very day when my talent pool is more or less unlimited. Now in the remote world, I can hire anybody anywhere. I, but even still, I don't care where you went to school. I don't care what you studied. I care about how you think, how you operate, how you work, how good of a teammate you are. And that's the profile that I built. And that's the sort of hiring process that I built for Looker. And now same sort of thing for the folks that we hire at Clary. Well, isn't that liberating that things like curiosity and passion are what really determine it, 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 uh, 
excuse me, determine success in life. And these are tools that are innately within us, within us as human beings. And sometimes we need to awaken the passion uh, in our life. But that is really good news for a lot of people out there. Can you tell us how in the real world, in the interview process, you assessed for curiosity and passion? What were the questions you were asking? Yeah, of course. So I, and again, bumps and bruises, Chris here. I, when I started interviewing people, <laughs> um, when I started interviewing people, I, I looked at, you know, I, I would Google top questions to ask a sales candidate or something like that. And inevitably on number one on every list is, you know, get, make the candidate pitch you the product. Um, make them sell you your own software, see how they would do if they were had to give an elevator pitch or be in a demo meeting with a prospect or whatever it is. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. And so I would do that for, you know, a, a year or so and probably dozens of interviews. And I always, I asked the question, I listened to the answers and I was like, what did I just learn? Basically, all I learned was how good can you go to clary.com read yeah. a handful of pages and then parrot back something that you learn. And yeah, okay, research is, is useful and that, that may be cool, but it wasn't ever super revealing about the candidate. I didn't find that answer to be predictive of their success in my role or at our company. And so I changed the, I totally shut down that, that line of questioning from my arsenal. And instead, I was like, I wonder what will happen if instead of asking them to pitch me my product, I'm going to ask them to pitch me their passion mm. and let's see what happens. And so instead of them talking about a technology that they don't know a ton about and SDR candidates, a lot of times are either new to technology or it's their first uh, sales role in general, you're not going to get a lot from them when you ask them to pitch you the product. But if I ask you, Chris, like, tell me about the thing in life that when you're doing it, you lose track of time. Tell me about the thing in your life that you want to evangelize that you tell your friends and family about that you annoy them because you're talking so much about it like talk to me about that and their response is the same as your response now like their eyes light up the smile comes they think about it for a second and then they launch in to this this diatribe about fitness or basketball or free will or whales or homemade ice cream right? all of these things are real examples by the way yeah and we talk about those things and i i probe them and i ask questions and i follow up and i i get them to unpack why this is such a meaningful thing in their life. And when those conversations go well, I think to myself, man, you just got excited about that. Now all I have to do is get you excited about my technology. And I'm confident that that passion that you bring to this area of your life can be translated into a business context and into an SDR sales context. And that, that's been the best predictor for me of somebody's potential future than pretty much anything else out there. How well do they communicate? How excited can they get about something? And how uh, crisply can they articulate why that thing in their life is so meaningful to them? Now, the flip side of that is also true. If I ask somebody this question and they're unable to fire themselves up or they don't have that spark or they don't bring that energy, it's probably not the best fit for the role. So that, that's been a, a huge unlock for me. And it's gotten uh, our team, our SDR teams that we've built to be wildly diverse in a really interesting and eclectic way. And I, I made the change many years ago, probably seven or eight years ago now. Never look back. Man, I could only hope as a candidate to have an interview with someone like you, where I think the interview would actually be very fun and spontaneous and authentic. So... Um, you know, we got a great comment from Aaron Fleck out there. Um, he said, uh, there's folks out there like himself who have a lot of passion, but they can't get past the first barrier of the resume piece. Mm. So it, it's hard to reach the face-to-face -face interview. And I understand that is really hard, but we didn't really prep for this question. But any thoughts off the cuff on that? Earning the interview is critical. And the things that you can do, and I think you said the, the questioner's name is Aaron. Is that right, Aaron? Um, it is uh, Aaron, yes. Aaron. So Aaron, what I would recommend to you is, I, and I actually published a little checklist on this, and, and Chris, you were uh, kind enough to promote that as well. But I have awesome. a, a pre and uh, well, a pre interview checklist. And one of the things I'll recommend to you, Aaron, and any job seeker out there is put yourself in the role. Like if you were a sales development rep, if you were a salesperson, one of the main things that you're going to need to do is do a, a lot of outreach inside of a company to get multi-threaded, to communicate to the entire buying group, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can show the interview panel or the hiring manager that you have this aptitude 
by doing this ahead of the interview. If you're applying for an SDR role, reach out to other SDRs yeah. on the team and ask for five minutes. Hey, I'm interviewing for the role. Was hoping to learn a little bit more about the day-to-day. -day. I've got a few other questions for you. Can you give me five minutes tomorrow? Reach out to a handful of SDRs, SDR managers, salespeople at the company, and build what we call a POV, build your perspective on that account. So that way, when you finally reach out to the hiring manager, which is the next thing I'll recommend, reach out directly to the hiring manager and tell him or her, hey, I just applied for your role. And here's why I'm excited about it. I talked to Alex, I talked to Vivi, and I talked to Karen, and here's what I learned. And I'm going to be a really good fit for your role because I hit the X, Y, and Z. Looking forward to the conversation. And that's how you can kind of collect more information, do the things that 99% of people are unwilling or unable to do, and set yourself above the crowd, aside from like formatting your resume and that sort of thing. Yeah. I haven't looked at a resume in years. I look at LinkedIn profiles and I looked at the communications that come across my desk, like directly to me or directly to our hiring managers. And those are the people that float to the top of the pile, frankly. So yes, have a polished resume. Yes, write good cover letters. But for the most part, just be proactive into the people that you're going to be working with. And it's a huge, it, it takes a lot of effort. You can't do this for every company that you apply to. I know that. But for the ones that are, you know, in your top five list, treat it like it's an account that you're trying to penetrate. Treat it like it's a deal you're trying to close. Go and cast a wide net for the cast of characters out there and learn what it's actually like to work at the company. I love that for the cast of characters out there. Beautiful alliteration, very poetic. <laughs> and what I'm hearing is that LinkedIn is actually more important than a resume, which I really believe. For and me, also, for me personally, I know other hiring managers. Yeah. When I work with people, you know, I, I, I think that too, you know, recruiters for top companies, the number one place I feel like they go is LinkedIn. Yeah. I actually got my job experience at Oracle, sold some cloud there, but a recruiter found me and my keywords were optimized and I had the, it was looking good. So LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. But the other thing I'm hearing is the ultimate resume or that's more, this is more powerful than the resume is creating warm inroads through networking. Maybe attend a webinar too to learn about the company from the inside, but ultimately reach out with humility and uh, in a succinct way to someone to set up time with an SDR AE and learn from the inside on what it takes to even craft and tailor your resume to what they're looking for and even see if they're willing to help uh, you connect and they might refer you. And don't think it a bonus if they you make it through and they might coach you. And so, and then you go to the hiring manager. So I just feel like that's, and that's doing the job, right, Kyle? That's and right, then, exactly right. And the best resume you have for yourself is your behaviors. Mm. You know, you can have the line on your resume that says that you are 140% a quota or that you did XYZ thing or you won some award and your honor society or whatever. But putting that into action and showing somebody how you achieve those results, that's, I mean, actions speak so much more loudly than words. And so that's what I encourage people to do. And again, it's a muscle that you build. It's mm. hard to do this. It is hard to do this. I want to be very clear about that. The thing that, actually, I have this book right here. Do Hard Things. Oh, I love that. Do Hard Things. This is a really good book, by the way. Um, they, these are the things that other people are not willing to do. And by definition, because other people, again, 99 out of 100 people do not do this, you stand out. You will get an answer. You'll get a yes or you'll get a no, which is way better than getting a no answer. So like, that's what sales is all about. That's what the mindset is all about. You have to be willing to do the things other people won't. And you have mm -hmm. to be willing to take rejection in stride, pick yourself up and get back at it, you know, an hour later or, you know, and, and you got to earn, you got to earn the interview. That's, that's the key difference. It's not just spray and pray a resume out there and cross your fingers and hope for the best. It's be proactive, control what you can control and earn the interview. Hmm. That is so wise and insightful. And I want to make a million commentaries, but let's just get to the next <laughs> question here that spon spontaneously came up. Another great question from Aaron. Um, the resumes or uh, the LinkedIn is important, right? So how, how do you beautify the LinkedIn and make it look good if you have a couple uh, pro tips? Yeah, for sure. So um, the, the headshot is really important. And I don't mean to say that you need to go and spend a few thousand dollars on a professional headshot. That's not what I mean. I think pretty much everybody probably has one of these. It's got portrait mode. So take a good photo of yourself. And I know that sounds silly, but it, it really, it makes a difference. Just look like a professional. LinkedIn is a professional networking community. It is not Twitter. It is not Facebook. 
it, it, yes, it is still a social media company, but it's a professional networking site. So show up like a professional. Um, and then in every section of LinkedIn is there for a reason. Your about me section should be the things that motivate you. It should be about who you are as a person. Your job history should have some sort of uh, explanation of what you did and what you accomplished. Just like build out every section. It takes time. It takes energy to do this. I, I did mine. It took probably a whole weekend of mm. you know sporadic uh, few hours of work here and there until it got to a place that I was pretty happy with it. And you talk mostly about your work oriented accomplishments, but fold in your personality. Like I have how my track record was up through SDR and into sales and marketing, but I own two corgis and I'm a, I love corgis. And you might've seen my, my mug earlier, the corgis on it. Like that's part of my personality. And I'm totally cool with 90% of my profile being work professional oriented and 10% of it being about me because that's, that's a good balance, I think, for LinkedIn. So every section matters in the LinkedIn profile. Build it out. There are really good detailed uh, explainers for how to do this well if you just uh, do a look, quick Google search, Aaron. And by the way, got to give credit to that question for uh, to uh, John Williams. So John. Uh, oh, yeah. John. Okay. Great, great mm -hmm. question. And we're going to talk about Corgis later as we get to writing <laughs> personalized email outreach. Because I remember, guys, I discovered Kyle listening to 30 Minutes of Presence Club. And I was like, who is this guy? He's incredible. And I think you mentioned... Uh, you know, tying in subject line, small but mighty. Uh, to your goal. We'll, we'll get to it. A little teaser. But uh, let's see. Um, in terms of the uh, interview process, I got two more questions around interviewing. Um, one is beyond um, being really good at bringing passion the way you answer questions, preparing for the questions you're going to be asked. What other pro tips do you have in terms of like research and preparation or maybe questions that you should bring to the table? What are other key things to prepare for when maximizing interview conversations. Uh, again, I'll point people back to the checklist. And, and if you haven't seen it, um, I, I shared it recently on LinkedIn. So you can uh, head over to my LinkedIn or to Chris's LinkedIn and it, you'll see it in our recent posts. But I th something that's so disappointing to me about so many interviews that I've done, Chris, is the candidate is completely unprepared to ask me any questions, which mm. is frankly, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like if you are really interested and curious and you're driven to work here, there's got to be something that is top of mind for you. And even if I'm the last stage of the interview and you've already asked the same question to another person on the interview panel, so what? Get a different perspective. Like don't just freeze up and have no questions to ask. So to build a good list of questions, research the company and its financial goals. If you're in a sales role, you are critical to driving revenue. This is true for SDRs. It's of course true for salespeople. So understanding the company's financial position is really important. This is easier to do with a public company where you can look at their stock performance and whatnot, but it's not impossible to do for private companies either. Just Google uh, their company name and funding rounds, and you'll see what kind of money have they raised when, and then read the press releases. In those press releases, the CEO or the chief revenue officer or whoever is going to be quoted to say, what are they going to do with that funding? Expanding internationally, uh, looking at mergers and acquisitions, rolling out a new product line, something like that. Have some perspective on what the company is trying to do, what its strategic initiatives are, and just ask questions about it. Like, and you don't need to have answers to these questions. You just need to ask thoughtful questions. Like, hey, saw that you guys raised $200 million. Very exciting. You're expanding into EMEA. What's that expansion going to be like from an SDR perspective? And ask the SDR director or whoever you're interviewing with, ask them, what is your plan to take what's working in the US and expand it overseas? Just curious. So that's one line that you go down, the company strategic initiatives. The other one is role performance. I love it when people ask me, like, what's the average quota attainment for people in this role? Yep. What are the best... Uh, SDRs do that the other ones don't. What separates the good from the great? And talk about individual performance in the role. And basically the, the question you're asking them is, how can I put myself in the best position to be successful here? And the reason that I like that so much is that if you show me that you're already thinking about how to be at the top of the pack, you're instilling confidence in me that you're going to be that type of person who is self-starting, who is motivated, who wants to be that leader on the leaderboard. And then that's a really cool thing. And it's hard to always evaluate that in an interview. But if you're the one forcing the conversation, asking those questions, it's a really good sign. Man, you're really giving us all the answers to the test. I, I love <laughs> here. And let's go to uh, Kevin Cheney's uh, question. And Kevin! Kevin from Google. You know, the legend. Great question. 
how, what are your pro tips for moving up internally in an, organi in an organization, uh, say from SDR to account executive, or maybe you're going from account executive to a leadership role? Yeah. Um, how do you approach the moving up internally? Process? Yeah, so first of all, hello, Kevin. You're a sweet man. Thanks for the question. <laughs> um, we worked together for a number of years. He's awesome. Yeah. The, um, the, the answer is very different depending on the type of move that you're trying to make. So the move from SDR to AE is very different than the move from SDR to SDR manager. So we, we can kind of treat them a little bit separately. But the, the answer that the commonality, I should say, is that you need to learn about what that role actually does and does differently than the role you're currently in. And you need to go get yourself exposure to it and show that you're capable of doing these things. So let's take SDR to AE, for example. A lot of times the SDR will create the meeting or create the opportunity and then hand things off to a salesperson and their work here is done. Okay, cool. That's good for you know the majority of SDRs. If you want to move and you aspire to move into an account exec role, you need to be able to give a demo, run discovery, negotiate deals, work with a sales engineer. You need to actually like steep yourself while you're an SDR, steep yourself in the process of running a deal. Go and if you have a call recording software, listen to the recorded calls at every stage of the sales journey. Go talk to account executives, go talk to sales engineers, go talk to frontline managers on the sales team and understand the same questions that we just talked about when you're interviewing for your SDR role. Ask them the same questions. What do the, the good A's do? What do the great A's do? If I like... I, I just watched this demo video and I saw that the sales engineer presented it this way to this persona. What, what would happen if I presented it this way to the persona instead? Have we tried that before? Like show that you're thinking about that next step in the journey, which is the role or the work that you would take on. So steep yourself in the AE role and go and interview as many people across the company. Make yourself uh, familiar with them so that they know what your aspirations are. Then the, the, other, the other side of the coin is if you're moving into a more of a leadership role, same sort of thing here. What does an SDR manager do that an individual SDR doesn't? Most of the time it's around mentorship and uh, career growth for people on the team, managing a team. As an SDR, you probably don't have a ton of opportunity to literally manage people. So you need to manufacture that opportunity for yourself. Look at the onboarding program. Spruce it up. You just went through the onboarding probably a year ago. What would you do differently now? Now that you've been in the role for a year, have a perspective on what future generations of SDRs are going to go into and help change that curriculum. Take a new SDR under your wing and mentor them. Help them accelerate their onboarding, accelerate their ramp, accelerate their success. Show your SDR leadership that you have what it takes to become a people manager. And importantly, Chris here, show yourself that you have what it takes to be an SDR manager. Like a lot of times people don't really know what is that next step in the journey for me? What am I actually going to be doing for 40 hours a week? And they'll take the plunge and they'll, you know, get the new role. And then they're like, whoa, this is not what I thought it was. Big mistake. So make sure that you pressure test all these different roles before you commit to them long term. And um, very long way of saying, do find a way to do that role before you take it. Mm, very insightful. Find a way to do the role before you take it to know if it's a good fit. And also to have a belief in yourself when you go to talk to the hiring manager for the next role that I can do the thing. Exactly. The only thing I would share from SDR to AE that worked for me at Oracle, because I can't speak to leadership like you could, is I sourced deals that closed and I had good relationships with my AEs. And I said, let me get you coffee. Let's sit down. Can you walk me through every aspect of the deal, the objections, the curveballs, how you positioned it? And I went to the hiring manager and I said, hey, I sourced this deal at closed. I didn't run it, but I could walk you through every step right now if you want me to. And I'm confident I can come in and, and run the cycle. That's, so that's the only thing I would say. And, uh, and part of it, you know, just is having confidence because we're all going to have imposter syndrome to a certain degree when we move up in a role. And I certainly felt that when I went to Google as well, but that's normal. And that means we're aspiring to greatness. I've got um, the next question uh, for you as we pivot um, before we get into your playbook um, for being a top SDR in 2023. A lot of individuals are thinking of um, breaking into tech sales this year and have been you know, last year as well, right? And I wanted to get your thoughts on picking the right company. Instead of just chasing any 60K job and, oh, I got a job and I got into tech sales, how do you make an intentional move that sets you up to maximize the career path? Man, such a good question. I think there are so many different uh, vectors to explore here, Chris, but probably the most important one is, do you want to work for a large established company 
or do you want to work for a startup scrappier kind of company? And the divergence there is a large company, the benefits, the virtues are they probably have it pretty well ironed out. You, you will go in, you'll have a pretty um, structured onboarding. You'll have a, pretty much every tool under the sun that you need to make use of. And you'll, you'll get a high degree of high caliber training. The downside is that your aperture will be probably more narrow than at a startup because they have it all figured out and they have a lot more specialization than a startup has. A startup will probably have far looser onboarding, far less training. You'll need to be much more self-started, self-starting. But because of that, you'll get exposure to things that you probably wouldn't get exposure to at a larger company. You'll, you'll understand a bit more about uh, cross-functional partners. You'll work more closely with the marketing team, with the sales team, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you just have to decide, what, what do you need? Do you need more structure or do you want more autonomy? And some people thrive in, in different environments. And you have to be honest with yourself about what's going to be best for you. So that's number one. Number two is the industry that you're in. Well, what kind of technology do you actually want to sell? And this is not the easiest thing to answer, um, but you can develop a perspective here. I spent the first six years of my tech career selling to uh, technical audiences, IT type audiences and data analysts, data engineers. And now I'm selling to sales and marketing people. And I much prefer selling to sales and marketing people. I find it more engaging. I find it more fun. I find I get to use a bit more of my personality. And, and that's cool. Like some people like that. Other people really like the, the data sheets, getting lost in the technical wrecks, like mm -hmm. being a student of technology a bit more than in personalities or personas. So you have to understand what, what is the right fit for you and what do you have a particular passion around? What do you actually enjoy learning about? And then you can apply both of those different vectors. And there's a lot more that goes into it. But those are two, I think, really important things that a lot of people don't really think too much about. Big company, small company, what industry do you want to be in? Matrix that out and, and pursue the thing that fits the, the checks the most boxes. Well, guys, um, at this point, we're going to shift gears to talk about how to be successful as an SDR and maximize the career path. And we've kind of touched on the, uh, the latter. But if you're getting value, make sure to give the like button a love tap. As I said, the algorithm will show this video to more people who could benefit from the message. We appreciate that. So Kyle, walk us through your playbook, your SDR playbook for 2023. What are its core components? Uh, first, let me say, I'll be personally insulted if people are watching this and are not hitting the like button. No excuse. No Take excuse. Me, not me. <laughs> Um, so l let me frame this up a, a little bit and then we'll get into the tactics here, Chris, which is the, the move that I have seen, I've been in and around SDR land now for 10 years or so. And the move that I have seen, the trend is this move toward personalization, this move toward research. Um, the buyers have an expectation that you know more about them personally, you know more about their company before you reach out. This has not always been the case. 10 years ago, the, the, the way to be successful in sales had a lot to do with learning about the buyer and the company after you've earned the meeting. And that's not true now. Now you need to have a fuller perspective and a, and a, a POV, as I said before, on that company and on that buyer to inform your outreach to them to earn the meeting. Very similar, Chris, to how we talked about earning the interview. It's the same sort of thing here for earning the meeting. And so the trend now is away from mass blast, spray and pray, email-based outreach, and is toward thoughtful, strategic, personalized outreach that hits on that person or persona or company or some sort of value that I can actually bring to them. So that's what the best SDRs are doing. That is what I've been preaching for a long time now. And I'm really happy that a lot of SDRs and SDR teams, sales teams in general, are coming around to this methodology. It means less spam less noise, better experience for buyers. That's what this is all about. You as an SDR are the tip of the spear. You are the first, in many cases, the first exposure that a buyer has to your company. You're a brand steward. You are the face of the company in many ways. You want that buyer experience to be top notch. You want to hold yourself to that high standard so that when they think of Clary, they have a good impression because of you. So that's the standard. That's the mindset. I'll pause there to see if you have any questions about the overall trend. Yeah. Um, you know, Jemmy, and I, I forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. I hope I'm saying it right. Um, said relationships are the greatest currency. And I really believe that. And creating a, a personal relationship and what my CEO at my company actually described as customer intimacy, which sounds kind of funny, is so powerful. And we really are cut from the same cloth. 
I, I'm not bragging. It's not good or bad. I've just never sent an email blast in my life. I've always just prided myself in the art of researching and giving emails a personal touch. And I realize I've been in sales for eight, nine years, not crazy amount of time, but not nothing. I've spent all that time learning how to write amazing emails. And I think if we look at it like an art and a craft, it can be um, really engaging work. And, uh, yeah, oh, cool. I said it right. Um, would love your thoughts, Kyle. Um, you know, we're going to dig more into cold emailing and what it takes to be successful, but, um, yeah, would love your thoughts on that. I couldn't agree more, Chris. And, and I have sent mass blast emails for sure. Uh, the difference though, is that like a, a good template is still a good email. And so we, okay. for my whole, for my whole life, I, I've been really thoughtful, my whole sales life, I should say, really thoughtful about what we're writing and how we're communicating. So the, the, the shift for me has been, okay, yeah, these templates are, are working and these templates are solid. And I understand the persona pains and gains and how I can speak to them about the value prop of my company at the persona level. But now I need to chop off the A there and I need to think about the person. Who is this person? They like uh, NASCAR or they uh, went to this school or they uh, are a youth basketball coach or whatever. Like yeah. people are very open about who they are on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever. Um, and again, one of the virtues of selling to salespeople is they're open books for the most part. And so we have a lot of, we, Clary, have a lot of fodder that we can use to personalize outreach to them. Um, but just like combining these two worlds of, okay, I know how to resonate with a persona. And now I need to think about how to resonate with a person. And if I can tie those two things together, that's where the magic happens. And that's what we're hyper-focused on. So I, you and I are on the exact same page there. And over and over again, the, the SDRs I see as successful in 2022 were the ones who embrace this mindset. And I see no sign of stopping moving forward. A little bit of a tangent question, but it, it sounds like you, you've, you're mastering uh, personalization at scale and is that, can you talk a little bit, is, is that part of what Clary is doing? It might be a good opportunity to dig into it. Absolutely. And, and I would say it depends on what you mean by scale. So a, a lot of people will say like, oh, well, you know, if I need to spend five minutes or 10 minutes writing every email, it won't scale. And it's like, well, it doesn't have to scale the way that you're talking about. Like you don't have to send 10,000 of these personalized emails every week. You need to send a hundred of them, which is still at scale. It's just not, you know, at that insane amount of spam email scale. So you have to adjust your, the way that you're thinking about what does scale mean? Scale to me means I can send a personalized email and have an informed conversation with the top one or two personas at every account that I'm reaching out to. That's what scale is. And if you're checking that box, then absolutely, Chris, this is the mindset, this is the methodology that we at Clary are infusing across our whole SDR and sales organization for that matter. And for that reason, it compounds and it scales. Now, the interesting thing is when you're trying to do this alone, it's very hard. When you're doing this as a team, it's still hard, but it becomes easier because we can reuse each other's work. Yes. If I'm doing research and I find out that you are a black belt in jujitsu, cool. I write the email and I log it. We have a little glossary that all of Clarion's share. Here's our jujitsu email. So next time we find somebody who's interested in wow. karate or jujitsu or whatever, we already have what we call the segue from the research to the value prop. So saw that you're a black belt in jujitsu. That's incredible. Um, to be successful in jujitsu, you know that it's about stamina as well as speed. Running your revenue organization is the same exact way. And that's what Clary will allow you to do, you know, something like that. And so we already have the email written. So now we can go every single time that we find somebody who has that interest, who has that hobby, who went to that alma mater, whatever, we have the email written. And so that's where the scale really starts to kick in. And that's what teamwork will really allow you to do. So I think we're digging into the criteria you have for cold emails that get meetings and you're hitting yeah. on the power of personalization and blending personalization into the subject line and in and, and the beginning of the email and, and masterfully uh, transitioning to the value prop, which is that that is artistry, you know. And so let's let's like dig more into the, the your core criteria for writing great emails. And I mean, feel free to expand on this personalization and blending piece. And then we can also dance to other 
factors if there are others that are important for cold emails. Yeah. So uh, I'm happy to, I'll also say that I've, I've written articles and I have long form yeah. stuff about all of this on LinkedIn. So if you're interested, I, I, uh, you can go to my LinkedIn and check out articles and you'll see like the formula for writing good e emails and things like that. But let me, let me, before I jump into it, say that the reason we are so focused, Chris and I in this conversation, so focused on writing is because writing well and writing clearly is thinking well and thinking clearly. It's very, very important that you learn this skill of writing because it means that you're able to take complex concepts and put it into a 50 word package. That's really hard. And so the more you hone this skill, the better and better you get at it. Now, of course, the better writer you're going to be, but you're going to be better on the phone. The reason I can come up in this meeting with you right now, Chris, yeah. and speak extemporaneously is because I'm so well practiced in all of these topics that we're talking about because I've sat and thought deeply about them and wrote, written about them for years. So th all this stuff that I'm saying is not just off the cuff. This is 10 years of experience plus at least three solid years of thinking about this and writing about it every single wow. day. So that's what it allows you to do. And, and again, going back to what we, how we started the conversation, the skills that endure, yes. the skill of writing as a salesperson, as an SDR, it will stick with you forever. I get compliments internally about the emails I write, the slacks I send that I'm like, I don't even think twice about it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, but then I think about it, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I, I took a complex concept and made it simple. T took it from a 500 word, you know, dense one page Google doc and made it three bullet points. And that's what this allows you to do. So that's why writing is so important. Um, any, anything to add there or should I jump into that? Yeah, no, that's the soul of wit right there exactly. is a soul of wit and it's hard, but our ability to communicate effectively is just a powerful tool to make things happen to, if you want to like raise money for a charity, you know, and make a difference for a great cause, your ability to communicate well can empower that. So it's just a beautiful thing. And so um, that's the only thing I would add. Um, but uh, back over to you in terms of any other pro tips around your criteria for writing awesome cold emails. Yeah. So I'm, I'll get into that in one second. I'll okay. say one other thing, which is people are probably wondering, or maybe even asking how, how do I improve my writing skills? Mm -hmm. Um, there are, so first of all, the, the answer is to read and to write like this stuff doesn't just happen by accident. It happens because of intent, just like anything else in your life. You're not going to stumble upon, you know, something wonderful just by serendipity. You, you have to be intentional about it and you have to commit yourself to it. So Quick note, by the way, um, I'm reading a book. Oh, you go, you go, and then I wanted to make a comment too. The, this book, The Bezos Blueprint, is a really good one on writing. Um, just Google pretty much anything, like how to become a better writer, and you're going to get the same five or ten books will pop up all the time. Don't you don't have to read them all, but just pick a couple and learn about what it takes to be an effective communicator, and then put it into practice. Don't just read the book and be like, "All right, I read my book for the month." That's not what this is about. It's about actually implementing the things that you learn. So. It takes commitment, it takes intent, and it takes practice. I was just going to say, you sparked a thought. I'm reading a book, The 12 Week Year. Yeah. And it's really great. And it says, intentionality is the ultimate weapon against mediocrity. Come on. Love and that. So, anyways, back okay. to you. All right. So <laughs> tactical steps, how to write a good email. So there are, and you're, you're testing cool. me here. I, I'm going to put myself under a little bit of pressure, but there are five good elements or five key elements, I should say, to an effective email. So five key elements. Number one, short subject line, short subject line. And I'm, I really mean it, Chris, like one to three words in a subject line. And why so short? Well, the answer is because when somebody receives an email from you, they're able to see three things. They see your name and not much you can do about that, your subject line, and then the preview line of the email that you're sending. The preview line is the first maybe 10 or 15 words of the email. Every email client has this and you, you can see those three, those three things. So keeping your subject line short maximizes the real estate you have for that preview line. Short subject line. And ideally, if it segues into the first line of the email or has some connection point to the first line of the email, you're doing something right. So that's element number one. Number two, that first line in your email should be personalized. Why are you reaching out to them? Now, the reason this goes in the first line is because they see it before they open the email, before they open the email. Your subject line and your preview line go hand in hand here. 
it's critical that you make the most use of that real estate. That's why I really dislike emails that start with, I hope this email finds you well. It's like, well, you just flushed that real estate right uh, down the good toilet. Point. Good point. So number one, short subject line, one to three words. Number two, preview line that has some sort of personalization or resonance with the persona. And when I say resonance with the persona, I mean, what is something particularly painful that they experience every day and what can you do to help them? So those are the first two elements. Element number three is some sort of challenge that they face in their day to day. If that challenge is related to the research that you've done, you're doing something really, really right. So if that challenge is related to the first line of the email, that's absolute gold. So what is it about their, the, the research you've done on the company or what you know about the persona or what you know about them personally that is a challenge that you help solve? And what you're doing there in steps two and three is you're saying, here's what I know about you. Here's the challenge that I know you are facing. And you're teeing yourself up for step four of an effective email, which is your solution. So most of this email, 80% of this email, Chris, is about them. I know this about you. I speak with people that are doing your, your job every day. Here's a main challenge that they face. And guess what? Here's how we can solve it. Mm. And you don't, what you do not need to do is you don't need to go into extreme detail about how you solve that thing. So we're going to make your forecasting process, instead of it taking days or weeks, it's going to take a couple clicks. That's how I solve your challenge. That, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to tell you about all the ins and outs of how you're actually going to run a forecasting process inside of Clary. We're going to go from days or weeks to get your forecast in to a couple clicks. Wow. Which leads to number five, the fifth element of a good email, which is your call to action. And the calls to action are the what I believe, uh, Josh Braun, he's an email guru on LinkedIn. He's amazing. But he calls us a low friction call to action, which is interested to learn more, curious to see how, worth exploring. These questions that create interest, that create curiosity, that spark somebody to say, like, yeah, I am interested to see how this process of forecasting that is a pain in the ass right now, how can you make that happen in a snap? That is worth exploring. So those are your five elements. Short subject line, personalization in the first line, a challenge that the recipient faces, your solution to that challenge in a succinct way, and then an interest-based call to action. And if you're hitting all five of those notes in every email that you send, I guarantee your response rates are going to go up. Now, they have to be less than 100 words, ideally closer to 50 words. And that's where the challenge starts to come wow. in. Yeah. So all of these things are combined, but those are the five elements. I, I hope that was useful. I mean, that's an oversimplification. It's, I could talk about this. It's really for useful and we could map out examples, but you have so much good content on LinkedIn and I'm sure in other channels that people can check out. So those five tips are actionable. And the only thing I would say is that the call to action piece is something I've never in my eight or nine years done that just simple, intriguing call to action. So I'm going to start implementing that myself. I love that. And I know you mentioned Josh Braun. It sounds like he's someone that everyone else should check out as well. Is it Josh? 100%. Braun? Josh Braun. Yeah. B-R-A-U-N. Okay, cool. And so now let's talk about, um, What's Lavender? Isn't that a tool or something that can uh, support you as you write your cold emails? What's that? Yeah. I don't even know. What's it all about? Yeah. So uh, many folks have probably heard of a tool called Grammarly. Grammarly is a writing assistant that helps check your grammar and spell check and all that. Very useful. Lavender it takes that to a whole different level for salespeople, which is it's basically, and I don't know if they would explain themselves this way, but I will do it. It's Grammarly for sales. So all of the best practices that we're talking about here, Chris, the length of your email, the tone of your email, the short subject lines, uh, cutting out complicated words, eradicating long sentences, like all yeah. of these things, Lavender tells you what you're doing right or wrong in one click. And wow. it grades your emails. It tells you the readability. It tells you how long it's going to take to read. It just it tells you everything you need to know to optimize email. So these are things that I used to, it used to take, I don't know, even three, six, nine months sometimes to train an SDR on how to do this well. We use Lavender now in, at Clary and like they just have this magic insight into wow. what's going well and what isn't in their own email writing process in real time. Yeah, you know what? I'm glad we hit on that because it's an opportunity for me personally to grow, I think, because I am Mr. Analytical and I do write long sentences. I've still managed to get by because I think people see passion and authenticity and a personal touch. But I, I'm going to check out Lavender myself because I think there's an opportunity to be more concise 
and it seems like great technology. So thanks for mentioning it. And I know it's helping you, helping you out at Clary and with your team. So let's talk about now how to get to the executive every time. Because when you get to the top, you know, you can make things happen. It's, it's so p people are going to think that I'm just uh, a broken record here, but it's very similar to what we talked about in the interview process where when, when we mentioned the interview process is go talk to individual SDRs on the team, go talk to the yeah. individual contributors and then showcase your point of view to the next level of management and then to the director and then to the VP. And that's the exact sort of cascading up methodology that's working really well for our team and for uh, the whole host of sellers that I know out there. The way that we think about it is what we, it's called, what we call it internally is walking the halls of the account that you're prospecting mm -hmm. into. Like imagine you were on site at a company's HQ before working remotely was a thing. And you just were spending a day inside of the, inside the, the, the company HQ and you were walking the halls, having serendipitous conversations with anybody you could talk to. That's what your job is here. Before you reach out to the chief revenue officer, before you reach out to the CISO, reach out to the people on their team. And then you get to use that information that you learn when you walk the halls. You get to use that information when you reach out to them. And there's nothing more powerful than saying in that preview line of your email, I talked to Holly, Michael, Kenny, and Maya. Here's yeah. what I learned. Here's what I learned. Here's what's broken. In the subject line you're saying? Uh, in the first line in the of the email. First line of the email. First line of the email. Yep. Um, and, and subject line would be talk to your team. Okay. Yep. I talk to your team or just talk to your team or some, or your team. If you want to keep it super short, then the first line of the email is who you spoke with Holly, Michael, Maya. Yeah. And they told me that your team is struggling. Here's your challenge with this, this, and this, we can help you solve that in two clicks worth exploring. And that's the way, like same exact little template that we just talked through in the email where you're starting, the personalization is the research you've done about their team. It's not about them. That's fine. The challenge are the actual challenges that you learned about when you were walking the halls. The solution, therefore, you know is top of mind for them because their team told you. And then your call to action is that interest-based, curiosity-based sort of call to action uh, at the end. And that's how you can earn the meeting, earn the right to speak with somebody who's higher up at a company. What I don't, I'm, a, I'm on the buyer side as well yep. here. And what really drives me crazy is when I uh, am on the phone with an SDR or salesperson and they have no perspective on my business and they're relying on me to tell them everything that they could have gotten from somewhere else. They could have done this research. They could have looked at a press release. They could have spoken with you know, somebody in the chain of command or whatever. And they're misusing the time that they're spending with me on this type of thing. So it's very much appreciated. Again, we, we talked about the buyer experience before and you as the person who's the brand steward, who is the face of the company for so many prospects, take pride in that. Take pride in that fact. Have a robust perspective on the account and take that to the executive level people that you're reaching out to. And that's how you're going to earn their confidence. Yeah, just to validate this, not that it needs validation, but when I was at Google Cloud, one of the top field sales reps coached me early on and said she actually doesn't go straight to the top. She intentionally slows down and connects with the end users and the IT managers or whoever, you know, uh, engineering managers to gather all the pain points and ammunition to then go and get that meeting. I mean, how is the executive not going to take a meeting when you spoke with their team and you have an intimate understanding of what's actually going on and you have a solution, like you said, that could solve the issue in a couple clicks? By the way, my door is open. I think a lawnmower is going off. So I'll hit you once I ask you this next question. But I actually had two more questions, but Jemmy had another good question in the meantime. And it goes back to painting ourselves in a good light in the interview process. So she actually has a background as a therapist, which is really cool. Awesome. I love that. And, and she knows her ability to connect with people and help meet their needs is her superpower. And so she's asking, we kind of hit on this type of thing, but if we revisit again, how does she convey that so the hiring um, company and, and the manager understands this about her? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's going to be different for, for every company because some hiring managers just operate differently than other ones. But um, the, the advice here is very similar to what we talked about before, which is you, you control the process. And if you can show them in the pre-interview forum, whether it's LinkedIn or email or whatever it is, when you're reaching out to them, you can show them that you have this capacity, that you've done the research, that, you under, that you've spoken with people there, and then you can ask them thoughtful questions in that outreach that you're doing to them. 
not necessarily to like expecting them to answer you via email, but hey, when we speak live, and you can be a little assumptive here, the salespeople love the assumptive close. Hey, when we speak live in the interview, here are a handful of questions that I've, I'm, I'm very interested in getting your perspective on. So that, that's a way that you can try and accelerate things and show people that you're operating this way, that you have this capability of asking deep and thoughtful and meaningful questions prior to the interview setting. Perfect. And you know, it's speaking of bumps and bruises, getting another bump and bruise with this noise in the background. We got two more questions. Let's bring it home. Um, you went from SDR to SVP. Walk us through the journey. Like what did you do in the real world just to, you know, illuminate insights on what it takes to progress in your career like that? Yeah. Um, you, there's no shortcut, Chris. And you know, the, it's not something that happens overnight and, and it's so much about mindset as we've talked about before, but the main unlock for me and the thing that, uh, that drives me and motivates me is I am so much more focused on making other people successful than my own individual success. Like I, I can't even begin to tell yeah. you that that is the thing that when you operate this way, when you are really motivated by helping other people, it does not go unnoticed. And you start to create, and what's happened for me organically, and I see this happen for a bunch of other people, is you, you start to have a group of advocates that want to see you succeed because you've helped so many other people succeed. So if you can focus on what your impact is going to be on other people, and that could be your coworkers, it could be your prospects, it could be your customers, it could be whatever, like focus on making constituents around you successful. And then there will be a halo on you as somebody who, you know, has the Midas touch. Everything that you focus on turns to gold. The people that you work with love you. And that makes a huge difference. You need people to be advocates for you. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a whole group of people that advocate on my behalf. I think it was Zig Ziglar that said something like, if you want to get everything you want out of life, help more people get what they want. And another um, example I heard was if you contribute to others and you focus on that, they will elevate you to leadership. And it sounds like that's something you've embodied. And I really do think it's that simple. So amazing insight. What, even if it's not in tech sales, you just want to get in the leadership and in whatever domain you're in, I think that's a great nugget. So the final question we have today, and then I did want to uh, close talking a little bit about Clary a little more, um, is, you know, we're not just one dimensional human doings and, and tech sales uh, reps. We can take that hat off and realize we're human beings and we have many dimensions to us. And I was curious, what does a great look lo life look like to you? You know, can you speak to that and what does it really take? And maybe how does tech sales enable that personal vision? Yeah. Um, so again, relating back to something we talked about before in the context of the interviews is what, what is that person's passion outside of work? And as I mentioned before, it's useful for me to understand how they can communicate excitedly and, you know, um, convince somebody of something. But the other thing, the other reason I like the question is because you have to have something in life that recharges your batteries. You have to have something in life that the, the work that you do is in pursuit of. If you don't have that thing, then like the, the, it, it makes me worried that you're going to burn yourself out. You, you need to have an outlet. And this is the coolest thing about tech sales is that it allows you in many respects to be the master of your own schedule, the master of your own time. And you get to uh, fold in those things outside of work and have the right integration of work and life. And so that that's the thing that's so important and for some people. It's very different for people like I, I run, I'm a runner. I run almost every day. If I didn't take the time to do that, to disconnect from technology and screens and things like that, I, I'd be ruined. I'd be in a terrible mood every day. It'd be awful. But I have the capability of controlling my own schedule, of finding an outlet for myself, of recharging my batteries and energizing myself doing something that I love. And I get to do that every day. That's cool. And so I hope that you have that in life and that outlet is something that energizes you, re-energizes you. Because the fact of the matter is, tech sales is hard. It's draining. It's a yeah. lot of work. You have to find ways to turn off the work switch and turn on the life switch and recharge and come back to work ready to tackle another day. So the question I pose to everyone is, what is that? activity or hobby or passion where you recharge your batteries. And if you don't have one, that's okay. This could be the year 2023 to find out what that is. So Kyle, let's finish up by talking a little bit about Clary. Why are you so passionate about it? And, and tell you know the audience a little about it. And I think you mentioned something about a free trap too. So Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we, we have a little free trial offer. We, we have a conversational intelligence uh, capabilities, uh, a tool called Wingman. 
a part of our product called Wingman. So if you're interested, if you're a, a seller and you want to record those sales calls and get a whole host of insights about what you're doing well, where you need to improve all of that, it's trywingman.com or you can go to clary.com and, and check us out. Um, why am I so excited about Clary? I spent the first six years of my life in business intelligence, the, this amazing product called Looker that could answer pretty much every question under the sun for a whole host of personas that weren't me. <laughs> and what, when I saw Clary the first time, I was like, holy smokes, this is what I've needed for so many years. And, and this is the way that revenue leaders think about Clary is it's this platform that actually allows them to run revenue in a way they've never been able to before getting insights about the past that they've never seen, getting visibility and insights into the present that they do not have, and therefore having this unprecedented ability to predict the future. And that's what Clary allows people to do. That's why I'm so excited. We're fundamentally changing the way that companies run revenue. And revenue is the most important business process at every single company. What do people care about? What does Wall Street care about? What do investors care about? The answer is revenue. And optimizing that business process using our platform is energizing, exciting, motivating to me. It's what's kept me here for almost four years, and I hope to be here for many more. Kyle, thank you for sharing your passion and insight with us today and your time. Very generous of you. I learned a lot. I know the audience was very engaged, asked great questions, and learned a lot. So thank you to you all for your participation in this elevating conversation. I put the um, link to tr uh, www.trywingman.com to try it out, and we'll link it in the description, but it's in the comments right now. I'm going to check it out. That's one opportunity and call to action. Another is to connect with Kyle and follow him on LinkedIn. He throws out amazing posts and they're very personal. They're handwritten, which is incredible. <laughs> so valuable. And so follow him, connect with me, of course, too. I put some stuff out here and there. And Kyle, any other um, calls to action or final thoughts from your perspective before we sign off? You hit it. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. Godspeed to everybody out there. Um, I promise you, if you take even, you know, 10% of what we talked about today and implement it, you're going to stand outside, uh, way outside the pack, yes. whether it's in, an, in a candidate setting, in an SDR setting, in a sales setting, whatever it may be. So again, I'll reemphasize, do the things that other people are not willing to do. Find ways to continue to be a learn it all, to think about how you can improve every day and it'll happen for you. It may take time. But it takes time. All good things do, but stick with it. Stay, stay motivated and you'll be successful. Amen. I second that. And guys, to your success in tech sales and in life, happy selling and happy living. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kyle.